Okay. So my name is Danny de Kok. I've been working at the KU Leuven for uh, over 20 years now, and I keep myself busy with uh, applied cryptography. Um, that actually means that um, uh, I focus on authentication and encryption systems, and um, I've been working on really many different aspects that you can imagine, uh, ranging from car-to-car uh, -car security to home automation to um, electronic identity cards to voting systems, really um, the very wide scale of uh, everything that you can imagine which, re which requires uh, the use of cryptography. So we work, um, I work at COSIC. Uh, COSIC refers to computer security and industrial cryptography. Bart Prenel is my chief. And the industrial cryptography refers to the fact that everything that we do is usable on the very large scale. That is what industrial cryptography refers to. So the IoT uh, matches very much the huge scale and um, it should actually be called the insecurity of the IoT, but um, we will do our best to give you a couple of uh, suggestions to make it more secure. So it is towards a secure IoT landscape. When you think about the IoT itself, basically IoT devices, they are very small and there are many of them. But basically there is not really a large difference between what you have as the normal computer systems and their security aspects compared to what you have to take into account when de designing and deploying uh, IoT sensors, IoT devices. The same concerns that have been studied in the payment systems in the uh, secure uh, communications mechanisms, the same concerns apply to the IoT. But there are a couple of um, very huge limitations, and that is power consumption, lack of um, uh, huge network access. So uh, they are a bit uh, restrained as far as throughput is concerned. So the number of bytes that are being sent and the number of computations that can be executed, that is what is limiting basically the IoT uh, devices. But all the other concerns with respect to the data integrity protection, to the confidentiality protection, they all match very well what has been studied already in the past. And therefore it is very strange that when we observe nature and you just see what has been put in the field and that has been uh, deployed in production, that they just have forgotten about almost everything uh, with respect to um, IoT systems. That is a huge danger. So why is this? It is basically because the chiefs, they are only focusing on locking in a client as soon as possible with as many as possible devices that can no longer be updated once they have locked in the client. So, that actually means that the developers, who of you develops real systems? Okay. Um, who is manager? Okay. Um, the problem is that the managers and the chiefs, they just give the instruction, make sure that it works. As soon as it works, no offense, huh? <laughs> as soon as it works. <laughs> Many of them. Eh? I will <laughs> refer it like that in a more uh, uh, <laughs> um, friendly manner. Um, many times the people, they get the instruction, make sure that it works and don't touch it as soon as you have something that can be shown. The problem with that is that as soon as it works, there is no updates of the keys whatsoever. The people have no idea anymore about how to fine tune it so that the algorithms can be updated later on, so that the keys can be updated later on. They hard code as much as possible, and that is a huge impact on the uh, further deployment of the system itself. So don't touch or reconfigure the working system, and certainly not before the client has seen that it works. 
as soon as a client signs it, it's even worse because they are no longer allowed to change anything. So the bottom line is that um, you have to do it right from the start. And that is extremely dangerous because you can't do it right from the start. Typically, you have to uh, develop and design your stuff three times. The first time the way it has been suggested that it should work, you do what you think that will answer the question. You learn from it. You redesign it in a way that um, it bypasses all the uh, security concerns, all the issues and the mistakes that you made in the first time. And then the difference between the second and the third time is very minimal. Because if you know your job, the second time it should be more or less stable, more or less um, flexible, etc. And the third thing is just cleaning up everything, making sure that it is production ready. But in reality, everybody sticks um, to only the first version. And that is extremely, extremely dangerous. That actually means that the backwards compatibility is non-existing. There is only one version. I've installed at my home um, quite a lot of IoT devices, uh, motion detectors, uh, lights, um, contact points where I can enter, um, the, uh, where I can switch on and off my uh, electricity, etc., with measurement devices. And I observe what they actually do. And the security updates are very limited. Functionality updates are huge, but that's it. They have never updated the security system of it. So that's the reality. Another huge problem is that everybody believes that they are a cryptographer. You are exceptional cases because you are following a course, this course, that gives you some insight and some up-to-date information about the current state of the art of cryptography, but you are very exceptional. That is extremely dangerous because the key management, it is very simple, but it is also neglected. Stuff is hard-coded. Algorithms are hard-coded. As you have heard from Bart Prenel, um, the SHA-1 algorithm, it has been deprecated for many years. Only last week it has been published. Now people think how to um, update it and how to migrate away from it. So these are the actual issues. Key management, that's what I've mentioned already. And the lack of the user awareness, yeah, <laughs> I'm quite strict about that. They don't deserve any better. So they want to buy the stuff as cheap as possible. So they get very cheap, uh, very cheap results. You have to pay for quality. And they just want to minimize their costs as much as possible. So I'm a very realistic person. So basically, the IoT systems that you uh, find in the field, they just focus on the uh, functionality and locking in the client as soon as possible. And when you see what happens in your telephones, when you uh, look at um, laptops and all the embedded devices, when they communicate with their host, it can be a telephone that is communicating with my, my wearable. Um, Everybody works in their own silo. They collect as much as possible the information. They do not share the information, GPS uh, coordinates, for instance. Um, they are actually all harvesting all the information, putting it as soon as possible in the, in the cloud. And there is no concern whatsoever about the privacy of the information, about making sure that the integrity of the information is protected. Nobody cares about these things. So that's a bit sad. The user data, the preferences, and um, um, other configuration parameters, they are pushed immediately into the cloud. I don't know whether you have ever uh, thought about it, but if you use, for instance, a scale 
to uh, weigh how much you weigh, um, to measure how much you weigh. Um, many of these devices, they just send out, before you see the results, the output of the sensors to um, everybody sends it back to the producer. The producer analyzes the information, fine tunes whatever is necessary, and then you see what has been filtered. Instead of with the old system that you just put yourself on it and you see immediately the result, you actually see the filtered result. Whether that's good or bad, that's something different. But you actually have very stupid devices like a terminal in the old days, uh, where you enter only the, the stuff in the user interface. All the processing is done uh, in the backend office, and you only see the graphical user interface. Is that bad? Not necessarily, but it may be a privacy concern. And the people are not aware of the fact that their information is shared all over the place. And you have no guarantee whatsoever that the information itself has been protected properly while in transit. There is an advantage, on the other hand, when you are using a medical device and it measures your blood pressure or your uh, uh, blood sugar uh, level and all the other parameters. The client, in this case, it would be a patient. They can no longer lie. So that's the only advantage. But basically, <laughs> um, the devices themselves, they may have been compromised, so they can have been fine-tuned. There may be uh, an application firewall that uh, uh, fine-tunes a couple of the results. That may have happened, but the person himself is no longer being able to uh, give false information to their medical doctor. So healthcare will improve due to the um, IoT introduction. The authorization of the information. Um, it is totally non-transparent who has access to the information because it is stored in the cloud and even the operators of it have no idea who is going to have access to the information. So the message that I'm trying to convey to you is when you design a system, you have to take control over how it is actually making sure that the data is sent to your own backend services. If you do it by yourselves, then you know how it has been protected. Then you know that it has been integrity protected, confidentiality protected, etc. And you don't depend on the lower mechanisms that are claimed to be secure. That is basically the bottom line that I want to convey to you. Our system is secure, we are using the AES. Does that actually make any sense? There is a very simple answer. Ah, exact. I prefer a system that is using triple DES or even single DES with a decent key management rather than something that has been hard coded using the AES. So using as a sales uh, argument, we are using the AES, trust us, sign immediately. Um, it doesn't make any sense at all. So you need to give much more information to the uh, people who want to become your clients. And the problem is, if you give them the actual information they should need, you are actually making sure that they get scared. So hiding all that sort of information is uh, something that has been uh, done as a business decision, which is also very sad. So who holds the keys is also a very good question because the IoT devices that you put in the field, they live there for ages. They cannot be updated very easily. Keys have been generated if it has been done more or less properly once per device, and then it doesn't change. So they live in the wild. They can be analyzed by everybody. You can just 
uh, pull them open, analyze what they uh, contain, their memory uh, uh, chips, etc. And then you learn the keys. What is that going to give you if you are an attacker? Many of these devices think of routers. They come with pre-installed keys. So if you have broken up one, and you have um, reverse engineered their content, you have broken all of them, or at least all of them of that particular batch. So it may give you a huge impact. If the keys are, if the keys are stored in the clear, that's also another issue. Because you don't have to think anymore about how to use them. It is just putting the cat next to the milk and the problem is solved. You hear many times that people have to design new algorithms for IoT systems. That is total nonsense. Hmm? As I have said in the beginning, you have IoT systems and you have the normal computers. They have to solve the same concerns. There are a couple of restrictions as far as the data that has, been has to be sent to and from the devices, their computational power, and the, me the, the memory capacity that I have as far as storage is concerned, and power consumption. These are the considerations that you have to take into account. But actually, they have to solve exactly the same problem. Sign data, calculate the MAC, encrypt data, and that's it. Do you really have to invent new algorithms for that? Not really. It may be that you have to use a couple of the newer algorithms that take into account the uh, power consumption and the memory use, but these exact same algorithms can be used for all the other applications. So there is no specificity with respect to we need IoT security protocols or IoT security algorithms, none whatsoever. There are a couple of them um, that are in the field. These are only a subset. There are many more, but it actually doesn't make much sense. Hmm? A good number of these protocols you're listing are horrific on low power devices. Absolutely. How do I reach out That is uh, a matter of money. Eh? It just is a stimulus to sell more expensive hardware. That is the only um, approach that is why they are designing these things and why they keep them alive. It's all about the money. But there is only the three properties, integrity protection, uh, confidentiality, and then the entity authentication. And all of them do that. If you really go to the bottom line, the station-to-station -station protocol, which is a very popular low-level algorithm, does everything. It only takes three messages. You can use it with whatever algorithm you like. And they are variants of it. Yes, but why is that the case? It has uh, a very sad reason. The reason is programmers are extremely sloppy. Instead of writing decent code, they just wait until the processor is strong enough to just run the crap. The algorithms and the protocols that they are still using in um, uh, these things, they have all been designed 20, 25 years ago. Exactly. Indeed. So that's not an excuse, right? Indeed. No. But it's all about the money. Eh? They just see 
you have to use our system. We are going to make sure that you are uh, going to protect it when there is an algorithm update and whatever. If you use our libraries, you will um, not have to think about these things. And then you sign um, the license agreement with the update uh, clause, etc. That's the money. There are reasons why I work at the university. <laughs> if you look at all the devices that you uh, can find in the field, this is only a very small subset. Um, you have the set of boxes, the variables, the control points um, with uh, contact switches, motion controllers, RFIDs, um, vehicles that can be controlled, uh, healthcare systems, temperature control, lights, etc. Many of these uh, systems can also be controlled by the if this, then that system. Who is using the if this, then that? One, very few, huh. which is remarkable. Many uh, times that I have uh, talked about this, um, it was more than half of the uh, audience that was actually using it. I'm really a fan of uh, the if this and that. Does any of you know? Who does not know what if this and that does? Who does not know it? Okay. So it is a centralized server that manages many different channels. And you can um, enroll your device um, to a certain channel and then the if this then that uh, system is going to control the behavior of the device, depending on the channel that you have subscribed to. An example is, for instance, the weather. You can say, if it starts to rain in my um, environment, my neighborhood, then I want this event to happen. So if this happens, then I want this to happen. The channels are referring to all the things that may happen. Temperature control, um, it may be delays with planes, it may be the hours, uh, it may be traffic, anything. So you can automate as much as you can imagine. There are really hundreds of different channels. And you give, for instance, access to your gate that opens the ro uh, road to your house. Hmm? Or even the, the garage door or the uh, entrance door or the lights in your house, everything that you can imagine that can be controlled electronically and remotely. As soon as you have opened uh, the gates to hell uh, with the uh, internet, uh, with the if this and that service, they are able to control your access, but also if there is an attacker who has access to their service, to their servers, they may gain control to everything that you have limited as far as the rules were concerned with the channels. So they may open Sesame whenever they want. You have given all control to the outside servers. That is a very huge um, security risk. So I'm actually looking forward to the day that they get compromised, because that is going to be a huge issue. Hmm? They will probably not publish it. Hmm? So it may have been, uh, it may have happened already, indeed, yes. And all the stuff that I said about the security of the data that has been stored over there, you have no transparency whatsoever. Eh? You do not know how your device that is going to send an alert that is going to trigger one of the rules, how that alert is being authenticated, whether it has been sent confidentially. There is no transparency whatsoever. They may require the, uh, the use of the HTTPS, but what guarantees gives it 
gives this to you if you are not able to verify the certificates that they communicate with. So it gives you a false sense of security. As far as the user is concerned, they want to have cheap services. They never realize that when um, they don't pay for the service, it actually means that they are the product. Hmm? They are being data mined. They are being um, targeted for advertisements. That sort of things make sure that the service provider is able to provide free services. So free services means that the user doesn't have to pay anything. But in return, he gives away all his concerns, privacy concerns, security concerns, everything you can imagine. And you have no guarantees with respect to the uh, quality of the service and that it will remain accessible um, over the uh, longer periods of time. When you look at the um, evolution with respect to the chiefs who are uh, giving the order to produce an application, there is a very huge evolution. In the old days, they required you to provide a secure solution. Now, the requirement has disappeared, but it has not disappeared completely. My slides are available online. I don't have don't have to type everything or copy everything. You can, but there is no need. Um, the problem is that the people are currently expecting that it is secure. In the parallel session, there is the session about the GDPR, um, General Data Protection Regulation. One of the uh, points that are mentioned there is that you have to produce as a software or a solution provider, a thing that has been designed with security in mind, privacy in mind, that sort of things. Hmm? These are very simple principles, but very hard to make sure. So when people are asking to get a solution, they do not have to mention everything explicitly. You should know that you have uh, to provide to them a secure application. And by making it less explicit, the disadvantage is that there are extremely large mechanisms to interpret what is secure enough. Hmm? In the old days with the uh, explicit requirements, you know, uh, you knew exactly what you had to deliver and the client knew what to check um, when you uh, had produced your offer. Now, it is debatable. They will solve it probably with a kind of thing like the common criteria, but that is also not very uh, good as a solution because common criteria are also interpreted. That's life. Now, I've already mentioned that once it has been designed, it cannot be modified at all. The software lifecycle is actually such that um, the, the people who are making the critical decisions are many times the developers. They are not being given the instructions how to implement things. They are just given the instruction, make sure that it's encrypted. And the developer himself has to think, okay, I will need a key. They will make very uh, in their own silo, um, their own decisions on how to do it. But eventually, there is no global structure that just pushes security policy for all the devices that will be produced by that manufacturer. That is a very huge issue. So the recommendation is that it actually should be pushed to the developers rather than the developers um, having to make their decisions themselves. Now, 
Have you ever thought about whether you want to pay something for a secure system? How much would you want to pay extra for a secure system compared to a non-secure system? What does security actually mean? It means that it um, says to the end user, no, you can't do this. It makes it slower and it makes it more expensive. So why would a sensible manager be willing to invest into something that is going to uh, restrict the comfort of their users? Only by law. And that is um, the advantage of the GDPR. Now people are being forced to invest into security systems. Hmm? But that is the only incentive that you can imagine as far as um, the stimulus to introduce it into real systems. So it has been um, introduced by the developers ad hoc. And the applications are rarely very modular which means that they are too complex. And if you need more than 15 minutes to explain how it works, nobody will understand how it actually works. So it actually means that you have to modify a couple of things in your business chain. Now, you are at SecupDev, Secure Application Development. What is the difference between secure and security? Hmm? Many people uh, confuse both. There is also a third term starting with an S that is safety. In, in car um, systems, home automation systems, there is also the concern about safety. Healthcare systems, uh, the same. Now, secure software and security software, the difference is basically security software relies on the secure software. It is a very simple um, difference. So I've enumerated a couple of issues, but what can you do about it? There are a couple of very simple things that you can keep in mind in order to get rid of many of these issues. And there is already some uptake from the very large vendors. So stop adding new features. That is one of the basic recommendations. <coughs> Check what you have already and improve it as far as security is concerned. Don't add new features, but make sure that they do their job properly in a secure manner. Hmm? So freezing the current status and only allow the modifications that are necessary um, to improve the overall security of your system. And something that I have very uh, shortly mentioned was the security of embedded systems. It's all about money. Eh? If you think about a payment card or an identity card or the, the chips in your telephones, they contain the small chips some of the uh, cards also have the RFID chips, RFID tags, that sort of things. That actually costs money. There is a reason why it costs money. That is because they are what you can call tamper-evident device. You have to open the device, show um, that you have fiddled with it, and then you can maybe have access to the keys. The more the device itself costs, the higher the security level is going to be, probably. Not necessarily, but let's assume that it is. So it really does make sense to invest a little in making sure that the keys themselves are protected properly. Then you can slot them in into your device, just like the telephone itself. The telephone may be an insecure device, but the telephone operator gives you a chip and they trust the chip. How that actually works, you will uh, get the bottom line in a couple of slides. If you look at 
the overall system, and I'm using a home automation system, but basically there is not really a large difference between home automation and whether you deploy it in a hospital or in a very large industrial plant. There is really no large difference. What do you have? You have the internet, you have um, the home with an internet gateway. I will refer to it as a home residential gateway. You have remote users, you have the evil people who are on the internet. You may have eavesdroppers um, that are eavesdropping on the remote user to their connection to the internet, or even uh, from the internet to the home residential gateway. Then you have all your devices at home that may be controlled um, either only locally or remotely, like for instance camera systems, you may have um, observation cameras, you may have um, uh, contact points to switch on and off uh, devices. They may be controlled remotely. Um, typically, a fridge, you need some physical access to open your fridge. So um, there are a couple of differences. But they can be monitored remotely for the temperature, for instance, or the content may be monitored remotely. Then you have the users the local users, and you have authentication devices and remote controls, and the remote control may be using um, secure systems, like for instance, a strong authentication mechanism or weak authentication mechanism. For instance, the remote control for a television, there is no user authentication. Um, everybody who has access to the device can switch on and off and change the channels of your TV. So there may be some authentication between the remote control and the TV itself, but the user does not have to authenticate themselves towards the remote control. When you use a PDA or a smartphone, there may be some stronger authentication um, towards the um, device itself. And many times they um, do not communicate directly with the control device. They will work probably through the home residential gateway that um, may have an abstraction of all the commands that you can send to it to make sure that the user interface is easier uh, for the application developer. When you look at what it actually means is that you have all your devices, so here on these lines and these lines, um, you have the devices and the users. And I'm a very large fan of, a very big fan actually, of the end-to-end um, -end and point-to-point -point communications. So that you know exactly what the security primitives are used, what security primitives are used and what properties they provide to you. So you can have end-to-end -end security and point-to-point -point security of each of the devices that you see in the, in the field. When a user has to authenticate to a device, that may mean that they have to enter their PIN or they have to swipe their finger over the device so that the user is being authenticated. Hmm? So from this device to whatever other device, there may be a path through the home residential gateway or a direct path so that you know exactly what they are going to do. Who of you is familiar with protocol stacks? Very well. Cool. Yeah, somewhat is enough. So it actually means that you have an abstraction layer of what the layer above is doing and what you can expect from the layer below. Nothing more, nothing less. It makes sure that you can think very easily and that you make very little mistakes. So the bottom line is we want to avoid making mistakes. Hmm? So everybody is going to benefit from it. And when the command is given to open the gate, I will have to have a secure communication from my remote control to the home residential gateway. That may be a point-to-point -point communication. But I want to have an end-to-end -end secure communications channel from my 
uh, device with which I give the command to open the device and to actually execute the command, really end-to-end. -end. That is something that um, makes sure that it can be logged transparently and that you have full control over what it is going to be doing. So in the GDPR, they focus on privacy by design. But if you think about making sure that you have secure IoT solutions, you have to think about much more than only privacy by design. You have to think about security by design, manageability by design, and usability and configurability by design. Hmm? So as soon as a system has been deployed in the field, it is normal that you have made mistakes while making something. You cannot test everything before you ship it. So you have to be able to update it in a serious manner. Serious manner, that means you require some code signing. And the firmware update needs to basically be also secure. Hmm? So that is what we mean by manageability by design. Making sure that when you put it in the field, that it is not, not, lost, not lost forever, and that you have at least the possibility to, uh, once it has been built into a house, that you do not have to break open your house and to uh, update it uh, hardware man in a hardware manner. That's actually how it works. Eh? Because many of the uh, uh, IoT sensors, they are just put in the plaster eh? while um, building your house, you just um, embed them into the plaster of the, of the thing. That is how it basically works. As far as the developer is concerned, what do they have to think about? That is the long-term security. Um, I do not know in what level of detail uh, you have been um, lectured about uh, perfect forward secrecy. Has that term been mentioned? Oh, very well. So it actually means that when you have something in the field and at this moment you break it open and you recover a couple of the keys, it should have no impact on the previous and on the future uh, session keys that are being used. So that is something that you have to take into account. The algorithms and the protocols, they should be considered as a parameter, preferably as a configuration parameter. So that whenever an issue has occurred, like for instance with the SHA-1, that has been uh, deprecated already for seven or eight years, but now it has become very urgent, you have to be able to change from one day to the other your algorithms and protocol suites. That is very easily set, but you have to take that into account while designing your system. Hmm? Network infrastructure, you have very uh, many variants of the Bluetooth uh, system, different variants of Zigbee, different variants of uh, Wi-Fi, etc. So. The hardware modules themselves, they cannot be fine-tuned. That's what you have to live with. But the key is at least make sure that you can modify them. And take into account that the devices, when they have been put in the field, that um, they can be analyzed by um, uh, people with malicious intentions. Um, they may introduce um, some uh, errors while calculating things. So when you put a vacuum cleaner very close to a cryptographic device, that may have an impact. Very large motor, very large uh, magnets, that sort of things, they may influence the behavior of your devices. And when you think that your system is secure, but you didn't think about the side channels that can have an impact to it, shit may happen. And what you have to do with certainty that is always making sure that you know which devices your input comes from. I care much more about the device authentication and the, in the data integrity 
knowing from which device information comes, I care much more about these things than about the confidentiality. You can see that I have no 40 degrees uh, Celsius currently. But when I am giving uh, my uh, data uh, to my medical doctor, he wants to know the exact temperature. Hmm? So while just observing things, these healthcare solutions, they are already in the field. Eh? So um, I don't know whether you have heard of it in the uh, recent weeks. Um, there was a project with a couple of medical general practitioners <coughs> that really do remote diagnoses of their patients. So the patient has received beforehand um, a couple of sensors with a webcam, etc. They register it to their house and people just log in into the system. They pay their uh, general practitioner remotely and he asks them to collect all the parameters and these parameters, they should be reliable. So integrity is much more, info, much more relevant than the confidentiality of it. In order to, th to do things properly, it's best to not reinvent the wheel. Uh, so what does that mean? As I said that the IoT solutions are very limited in difference uh, compared to what you have been doing already in the field for many years. Just look at the other things. How do payment systems do it? How do uh, the RM systems, so the uh, copyright protection, how does that actually work? They make many mistakes in the past. They learn from it. Just use what they are doing now in order to avoid making the same mistakes for your own applications. You may fine tune a couple of the algorithms to the environment in which you are um, going to deploy it. But basically, the bottom line has been analyzed already for many years. So take advantage of it. And then it really makes sense to um, assign a couple of security architects so that they are able to give the instructions to the developers team and so that they do not have to make their own decisions. Hmm? That is an extremely important um, point to take into account. And the ideal solutions actually um, require no configuration at all or as little as possible. When you look at the Bluetooth um, security mechanism to register, for instance, a keyboard or to register a mouse, Bluetooth mouse to your telephone, to your PC, it only requires a very simple pin to confirm that you have the presence of the device itself and problem is solved. All the cryptographic things that are happening underneath, they are complex, but the user himself does not have any idea about the complexity of these things. So it is nearly zero configuration. Only making sure that you have physical presence and physical access to the devices. <coughs> and then we come <coughs> to, um, the, to the system that I actually um, want to um, see evolve in the future. As I mentioned already, I have many systems at home, um, real IoT systems. You just have to live with the fact that they are insecure. But how are you going to deal with it? It's almost impossible to modify them. It's almost impossible to correct them a little and to correct, to configure them properly. That is just uh, virtually impossible. So you have to accept it. How do you accept it in a wise manner? Wise um, with, with some um, 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 quotes. What I do is basically um, I've 
designed my network environment in a couple of virtual LANs. So if you know the concept of a demilitarized zone in the network um, terminology, that means that you have devices that are active in the controlled environment, the controlled part of the network, and they may have access to the internet, they may have access to individual devices in your home network, but there are firewalls around it. And the firewalls, they just allow certain devices to communicate with other devices on certain moments in time. And that is basically where you have to evolve to, in my opinion. So when you um, deploy your system, I have from uh, my machines um, control over my Raspberry Pis. I control my Raspberry Pis. And I can switch on and off whether my light bulbs, whether my cameras have internet access, yes or no. So by default, they are not able to communicate to the outside world. And it is me who controls when they can do so and when they shouldn't be doing that. Many of these uh, things are actually requiring updates. I deny their updates until the moment that I think it is okay to do it. Hmm? So when you buy a normal light bulb, hmm? so the, um, the thing with the Wolfram uh, wire inside, how many times do you change your light bulb? Yes. Once every year, if you... Um, you need to change the light bulb, right? Hold on, once every 20 years. Yeah. You need to properly set yeah. up the light bulb. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. It may depend on the environment where you are working. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> if there is some fluctuation in the power uh, uh, in the net, the power net, then they may be damaged uh, quite quickly. So it really depends on the region where you deploy your light bulbs. Yeah, something between one and 10, that is a reasonable um, age that you can imagine. But basically you screw them in and you don't touch them anymore. Okay, I monitor how many times my light bulbs ask for an update and get updated. That's every three weeks. The functionality is still the same. Eh? So <laughs> I switch them on and off from a switch. They just turn themselves on and off, and that's it. They can be dimmed also, but basically that is not uh, the point. Hmm? They have to be updated very regularly. And if you dare to not do it, so for a couple of them I uh, refused to update them, after something like a year, they are no longer able to update themselves. They still ask, but the software supplier has stopped supporting their firmware. So the update of these light bulbs, they are lost forever. Hmm? Is that good practice? I don't think so. But still they do their job properly. When I switch on and off, they do it. Huh? So, I don't understand why they have to be updated so frequently. The same goes for the motion detectors, the same goes for the cameras, etc. So by having control over the network that allows them to uh, update themselves or not, you have the possibility to minimize your risk. Something else that I have not yet mentioned is the fact that taking ownership is very hard in the world of the IoT. You go to a shop, you pay something like 50 uh, or 75 euros for a pair of light bulbs. They claim that they will last for 23 years. And then you screw them in into uh, your system and you start using them. Everybody is happy. You get a visitor, whether it is a burglar or a regular visitor, doesn't make much difference. 
They replace your light bulbs. They didn't pay for it. Hmm? But they can reset everything and take ownership of the device. Hmm? So that is one of the issues that has not been thought of when deploying large-scale IoT systems of today. So there must be a mechanism when you make something to take ownership of it. People did never think about having a look at, for instance, the TPM. They were faced with the same issue. So the first one that takes ownership of it is a master of the TPM. That mechanism has not been deployed in IoT devices that you can just find in the field. Is that wise? I don't think so. Will I pay a lot for my light bulbs? Not really. I will just visit somebody who has them. Hmm? <laughs> and problem is solved. I mean, for the time being. Yeah. <laughs> the best is to make sure that you don't get caught. The use case. Yeah. Well, I have uh, a couple of neighbors. Mm -hmm. They have deployed their garden yeah. with IoT based light bulbs. Cool. You just have to visit their garden, yeah. screw them out. Yeah, no, but I don't see the use case for why, why would you have, have Wi Fi enabled light bulbs. I mean, and that's, that's why. I ah, don't yeah, yeah. That that's a different use case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Indeed. Yeah. People want to have the possibility to have control over the individual light bulbs. Yeah. So when I am at home, my Raspberry Pis know that I'm at home. They activate a couple of things so that I can manage them from my telephone. I can also manage them now from my telephone when I inform my Raspberry Pi to open the gates to hell. But um, after a certain delay, after a certain delay, they are switched off automatically. That's basically the kind of thing where we have to evolve to. Why? So why? Just because otherwise you have um, all these people who are not aware of their security risks. People are lazy by nature. And that is the reason why the IoT systems are very popular. And it is very cool that you can show during a meeting that you can control um, your light bulbs and that you can show with a camera um, that they have been switched on and off and that you can uh, observe what your wife is doing. That sort of things. <laughs> hmm? But the risk is that you're not the only one who is able to do that. Oh, no, of course. And that is why you have to prevent unauthorized use. And as you cannot modify the devices themselves, the only solution that is possible is avoiding that they can get accessed without your authorization. They don't listen. People don't <laughs> listen. They don't read manuals. They want to have the services. And it must be as cheap as possible. So the only way you can deal with all these requirements from the users is by making sure that it cannot be abused by default. So when I register a new device, um, I just make sure. The only thing that I have to do is making sure that that particular SSID is being used, and I don't have to worry about all the rest. Because my Raspberry Pis act as um, the gatekeepers, yes. Mm -hmm. So it is very simple. A normal user can also do it. I do not consider myself as a normal user. Eh? But it is not that comp complicated to just do it. 
And that's the only solution that you can give, in my opinion. Isn't that? I see you are a bit. <laughs> you surrender very easily. <laughs> Yeah, I have mentioned if this and that. It actually means that when you have your controller of your light bulbs, mm -hmm. if you have registered that one to the if this then that service, that they may take control over your house. Yes. And that has already been shown as being a real use case. Um, and the problem with the legal uh, people is that is a burglary without traces. So there is no real break in. That actually means that the burden of proof is extremely hard. And you will pay for it. Hmm? And, and light bulbs are, are one thing. If they start flashing, flashing at random, I, I, I just pull them out from the mains and, and I'm done with it. But I never in my life would think, trust my front door with an, uh, with an electronically controlled switch. That is exactly the bottom line that you have to take away from this course. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so all the life-threatening things should never be controllable remotely. Full stop, whether it is um, from outside the house or not remotely. Eh? So the example has already been... Yeah. At our uh, department, we have an IoT fridge in the sense that uh, we can just present our personnel card and if it is a registered user, mm -hmm. um, the fridge uh, says it will open and you can take whatever you like. Then you uh, enter what you have taken, you close the fridge and your account will be uh, balanced, uh, aligning with the price of what you took. That is one thing. Nobody has actually thought about how to circumvent the system. It's extremely easy. There are a couple of colleagues, I will not tell everything. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually extremely easy. You just have to do a power cycle, for instance. That is only one. Huh? <laughs> That's one of the yes. Yeah, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll a power cycle, the thing is going to do a self-check. What is a self-check? It will open Sesame and it will close Sesame. <laughs> Problem solved. Huh? Yeah. Don't abuse it. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you have to think about. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. yeah. You have to be pragmatic at some. Yeah. <laughs> so the bottom line is really that you just have to make sure that um, the remote management of uh, things that are critical, that you just should not do it. Because it's very easy. And because they want to show off. They want to show off more than, yeah. more than being easy. Yeah. Indeed. And that is the huge risk the huge risk of the huge risks of the system. I learned to live with it. And my solution, I believe, I've not yet encountered a better approach to deal with it. So that is also what I try to make sure that everybody is going to start using in the short future. If you want to become rich, there is a very interesting profession, and that is the e-electrician. The person who is installing and configuring the home automation systems of the people. Because currently, I mean, the simple electricians, it's normal that they do not know everything, but they know how to uh, make sure that the wires are connected properly. They know how to connect everything. They know how to distribute uh, the, the power load, etc. But they are not familiar with configuring the stuff. 
So everything comes with a default configuration. Who are you going to pay to configure it? That is the electrician. They can charge whatever they like. So if you want to consider a new job, that's the way to go. And the number of people that are knowledgeable and that are able to do it is extremely small eh, on this very moment, and there is no competition. <laughs> so my closing remarks, <laughs> they are very simple. Um, you may think that I'm kind of uh, um, uh, sad and kind of pessimistic. It's actually not true. I'm very realistic. All the things that I've mentioned, they are proven. And uh, I have demos, not live demos right now, but contact whatever you like, whenever you like, and I can show you that it's actually a real concern. So if you have any questions, feel free. If not, you can have an early break and then go to lunch. Any questions? Everything is critical. I was, but I was thinking, I have a five detectors in my set of five detectors mm -hmm. in my house. If I make a system so that when they are uh, switched, I will put an alarm on my phone and that shouldn't abandon the system by itself. Mm -hmm. That is the kind of things that I fine-tuned with my Raspberry Pis. So they act really as an application firewall. And they see, ah, there is an alert from this type of device. I will always allow it through. But by default, it will not be able to get through. So it means that it will try to get out. And I depend on the retry of the device so that in the first time it will be blocked by default because it is an un unauthorized um, message going out. It is analyzed. The conclusion is it should have gone through. I do not resend it. I just wait until the device uh, repeats the, the call. It may have uh, some impact, but that's a price I will pay. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, Synology. I have a Synology uh, NAS um, at home, and um, it's also blocked by default by my uh, Raspberry Pi. And when I want to synchronize some of my data, I just um, instruct my Raspberry uh, to open uh, the gate. All the synchronization takes place when the device at that particular moment will also do a software update. It will happen. So I do not um, have that fine grained control, but um, that is the way that I approach uh, that sort of thing. So by default, everything is always blocked. And when I get a notification from my Raspberry Pi, then I will have an, anal an analysis of it. And if it is a device and it makes sense, then I will just open the gate for half an hour, an hour, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, in that example, um, the companies they should have their own um, gatekeepers installed at their clients. So where I have been mentioning the Raspberry Pis, the companies that are controlling the uh, sites from their clients, they should have the home residential gateway that is basically um, doing that control. So that, that's kind of 
Ja. No, that means that you have to have very fine grain control over the endpoints, the IoT endpoints themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, that is the, the role of the e-electrician that I was referring to. The one that configures that device, that is the one that will specify when the updates will be checked, when the updates will be installed, etc. And that may be pushed um, to the devices, but it requires that the device themselves are able to do it. So it will require a specific firmware, probably under your control, so that the device itself will behave like you want. Because the default devices, they don't behave like you, like you want. And as you cannot modify them, you can only fine tune their behavior on the network level. Yeah, so the zero configurability and the fact that the configurations should be pushable to the devices. And the configuration itself should have been signed by a trusted authority. <coughs> For instance, the e-electrician that I was referring to. But you really need to modify the devices themselves. You cannot buy something off the shelf. There could be some standardization body that is going to... Um, start in existence in a couple of years from now after they see that there is a need for it. But for the time being, it's totally impossible. And therefore, you have to limit yourself to network accesses. But it seems like you're suggesting that we just have to, that I have to go to my mother and say, okay, here is the Raspberry Pi, I'll tell you how to use it. I mean, that's, no. that's a bad solution. No, or? it is a website. It is just a web page. Eh? whether it is on a Raspberry Pi or on whatever other but, device. But whatever, I mean, I don't want to go to users and tell them how to protect themselves from their IoT devices yeah. and give them, give them control. I mean, it's, it's a nice solution for tech savvy people like us, but it's... The other ones, they will get punished. Exactly, so, yeah. I mean, I think it's a good question. It's like, how, how do, we should look into how companies should improve their IoT devices so they are secure and ready to... Well, by making sure that the configurations can be pushed to it, it's very similar to um, the way you have the update mechanism of software on a telephone. So you have the code signing and there is the possibility to install them automatically or that you can say, I want to be notified and say, now you can do it. That kind of mechanism, that is what has to be embedded in the IoT devices. But it means that the IoT developers and the designers of their systems, they have to take action. That's true. But the problem is that, for instance, you have the very large um, solution providers like Fitbit. Will you be able to tell them that they have to modify their mechanisms? That's totally impossible. Eh? The way they are deploying their uh, variables, the way they are uh, making sure that the hubs or uh, Belkin with their Remo devices, Philips uh, with their U things, it is totally impossible to stimulate the very large providers of IoT um, consumers and devices themselves to make sure that they are doing their job properly. I don't, I don't agree with that. I mean, just, I mean, find a product, publish it, you know, make people aware that there are problems so they can, companies 
things. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm not saying that that's a good idea, but uh, <coughs> that's the way companies... I've start. been working in the field for more than 20 years. That doesn't work. Well, I think some companies start doing security because of big breaches, and I mean... Yeah. Yes. I think my experience. Yeah. I don't think you think that's good enough. I think giving the advice and giving all the tools necessary to actually secure your device is easier rather than touching it with a blindfold. Yes, but the use of HTTPS is actually a very dangerous uh, example because it only gives you point to point security from your client being your browser mm -hmm. and the server. What you actually need in IoT systems is end-to-end -end security. I want to uh, give the command with my telephone to switch on and off my lights or to open the gate um, so that I can uh, park my car. That is end-to-end -end security. Whether it has been sent over an HTTPS connection or not, I actually don't care about these things. HTTPS is very important to have a first layer of defense but it should not be the only thing that you care about. It should really be on the application layer that you um, take your own control. And that is why you have to modify the devices and make them configurable. I had a backup slide um, with respect to uh, this sort of thing. You have a control point and a control device. Um, if you are a bit familiar with um, uh, UPnP control points, that is the kind of terminology um, used in that field. So at the application layer, you have the control point and the device um, is going to be controlled. So when I send a command from my telephone, I want it to have been signed or marked, that depends on the application itself, I don't care about that, integrity protected, and the gate needs to verify whether it was originating from a trusted device. So from application layer to application layer, and I don't care about the security features of the communications layer itself. So we have three layers, application layer, secure communications layer, and the communication layer itself. So the secure communications layer that is where you can consider the HTTPS or an IPsec tunnel, that sort of things. That may be the um, secure communications layer. Then you have the physical layer where the data is uh, sent over the wire or over, the, um, over the, the air. That doesn't really matter. But it is in the blue part that I want to see the security features. <coughs> And that is the only thing that is going to give you guarantees. So when you have your plant that you're going to control um, from a remote uh, location, that is at the blue layer. And everything underneath can be untrusted. I do not trust anything below the blue layer. And you have been given all the uh, know-how um, to actually implement it in a secure manner so that you can take control over the, over the devices. There's, there's a lot of pressure, especially with, let's say, temperature control from your home. Um, I'm not sure where the actual program that now is running on a recent basis is, is actually stored. It may, may be in the cloud. But it may be in the cloud for, for reasons of, of this data aggregation and analysis and, and, and having, I have no privacy in that regard. Mm -hmm. so I do not really mind that, but indeed, and I'm not sure if I, if the internet falls down, if, if I can still control the temperature of my home. That's an interesting factor, but still, there's that other pressure against it, and, and that's where privacy regulation probably comes in. We want <coughs> our privacy devices to be intelligent. We, we can control from our car that we are, we'll be home in half an hour, and it's earlier than normal, so we can adapt the program uh, dynamically. That's all great. And so there's a pressure for, for analysis, and there's a pressure for, for, for remote access. And that, that we find
quite superb to the control point being literally point to point from my mm -hmm. right phone to my device. So that's, yes, I do agree with you. I would love, love to have uh, been able to scan something on my, uh, mm -hmm. uh, my device. And this one is authorized uh, geo, uh, the two-way mm -hmm. authentication. Mm -hmm. It's true, yeah. And Philip Schuna does a great interesting thing with real time setting the lights of the, of the room based on, a tele on, on what's happening on the television program, mm -hmm. which is actually really cool. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to watch an entire flash turning blue and red and, mm -hmm. and yellow uh, uh, from, uh, say, the voice. In sync. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's inventive use of, of mm -hmm. creative use of uh, actually uh, of devices. Indeed. But you actually only want that the correct devices are able to do that. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, you still have to, have to do some authentication that your dogs are going through your phone going to be authorized. Indeed. Yeah. So when you look at it in detail, many of these systems, they just depend on the network authentication. So if you have been registered on the same um, network, Wi-Fi network, they will see each other. If you have registered them in different networks, they will just be total aliens. Yes. Yeah. Or they have to be controlled all the way through the internet. Yeah. That's, that's not a yeah. problem. So all the systems that are network-based as far as their functionality is concerned, they can be controlled perfectly with the system that I would suggest. Mm -hmm. And for the time being, it's the only way you can deal with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and those Mm -hmm. I mean, I just bought something, uh, a temperature controller from, from Nasus, and that's going to be there for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. They last too long. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they do last very long. Yeah. And, and yeah, well, yeah. Exactly. Voilà. If there are no other questions, we can go to lunch. Yeah. Hello?